Sleepover stories are some of the scariest stories around. I'm sure we all remember telling horror stories when we were younger, jumping at every noise and convincing ourselves that there was a monster. Before we begin, if you think you might fall asleep, please introduce yourself in the comments, and while you're there, please like the video and subscribe if you haven't already. I'm always interested in knowing what country everyone is from, so let us know in the comments and share what time it is where you are. Thank you once more for joining me. Get cozy, grab a glass of water, turn the lights off, and make sure you've locked your door. Don't forget to say hello in the comments. It's time to close your eyes. I've always been good friends with one of my cousins, Cole. We're both the same age. The two of us were not quite inseparable, but we always did get along very well together and were often found together, both in school. As we'd always end up in the same class together throughout elementary school and outside of it. When we were 12 and in the sixth grade, I was hanging out with Cole on a Friday afternoon around the later part of May and we were psyched at the start of the weekend. We'd wound up at his house, since he didn't live too far from me, and at one point my mom called to say that our grandpa was in the hospital. While the issue with our grandpa wasn't expected to be life-threatening, he was being kept at the hospital overnight for observation, and both my parents and Coles were planning on staying with him and grandma at the hospital, since my mom and her sisters were the two of their siblings who lived close by. I was told that I was given the okay to stay at Cole's house for the night, with Cole's 15-year-old brother Hunter being in charge while our parents were out. This was fine by us. I got along well enough with Hunter, and he was never the bossy older cousin that some of my other friends said they had to put up with. We ordered out for pizza, and enjoyed goofing off. At around 9 or so, there was a knock at the front door, and Cole went to answer it. I was a bit curious as to who it could be at that time of the night, and so I watched from a ways back. At the door were two older guys. They said that they were with the city and that they were investigating reports about the water pressure supposedly being bad in the neighborhood. They asked Cole if his parents were home, and when Cole said they were unavailable at that moment, which we were told to say to strangers if our parents weren't home, the guys started asking a bunch of questions about how the water pressure was in the house and if they could come inside to check. Hunter came over at that point and politely told the guys that the water pressure was fine and perhaps they should move on to check on other homes in the neighborhood. The guys seemed reluctant to leave but turned and walked away after Hunter started closing the door. After the door was shut, we looked at each other and shrugged but didn't think too much of it after that and went back to goofing off. Eventually, we decided to go to bed. Cole and Hunter shared a bedroom, and we all agreed that I'd sleep in there with them, rather than me hitting the sack on the couch or something like that, so that we could talk while we fell asleep. Hunter grabbed a sleeping bag out of their camping supplies for me. When we got into their bedroom, they stripped down to their briefs, and I remembered Cole had mentioned to me once a while back that they had started sleeping in just their underwear. Since I hadn't originally planned on staying the night, I hadn't brought anything with me from home as far as overnight stuff, but since I wasn't in the mood to sleep in my clothes, I stripped down to my briefs as well, though I felt a bit embarrassed, even though we were all guys there and I knew they wouldn't say anything or be judgmental. They climbed into their beds and I quickly crawled into the sleeping bag, and after talking for a while about random stuff we eventually fell asleep. Early the next morning I got up because I had to pee, and so I quietly got out of the sleeping bag and did my business in the bathroom. On the way back to the bedroom I heard something in the family room, which was on the opposite end of the house from the bedrooms and particular bathroom I was using. I didn't pay too much attention to it at the time, thinking it must be either Cole or Hunter, until I got back into the bedroom and realized that both of them were still in there. Try not to panic, I woke them and told them that I thought someone was in the house. They quietly followed me, and the moment we walked into the family room we saw the two guys from the night before in there, and it was rather clear they were robbing the place. One of them started moving towards us as he pulled out a wicked-looking knife. 
The three of us promptly raced to the front door, somehow managed to get it unlocked and open, and we fled outside. As luck would have it, a cop was driving by at that particular moment. We quickly flagged him down and told him about the two guys in the house. The cop called for backup, and within a couple of minutes several other cops were there, and they proceeded to enter the house, and after some searching they caught the two guys. The cops figured out that the two guys must have entered from a window in the laundry room that had a broken latch, and had probably targeted the house because, while it wasn't empty, they probably realized that there were no adults there and figured that if we discovered them, we could be more easily dealt with than adults. To add insult to injury, while we were waiting outside while the cops searched the house, some of the neighbors came out to see what the commotion was about. This included some kids who went to the same school as Cole and me, including a few who were in our sixth grade class with us. It was during that time that the three of us realized that we never had the chance to get dressed. So just like in the stereotypical nightmare, we had to stand outside in full view of everyone in just our briefs for what seemed like forever, before being allowed back inside. When we went back to school on Monday, we had to put up with more than a bit of snickering, stares, and mockery for the next few weeks until school ended for the summer. I've never been good at making friends or any type of bond with people in general. I'm not even close to most of my family members like I'm close to Jessie. Jessie is my best friend. I've known her only for a year and a half, but she's literally my world. She's the only person I can speak to, the only person who understands me. I've never slept over at anyone's house that isn't mine, and even when I'm supposed to be staying at a family member's house, I get anxious and they have to call my parents to collect me. This results in my parents having to cancel everything that they plan. My parents resent me. I'm a huge burden to them because of just how anxious I am. Jessie asked if I wanted to have a sleepover at her house. I'd never been to her house, or anyone else's house for that matter, and I'll admit I was ecstatic, but also hesitant in case I got anxious and ruined the sleepover and my friendship. I knew I was probably overthinking, but it still scared me. Jessie gave me some time to think, and I eventually agreed. I told my parents and they were pretty shocked, but decided to let me go because I had an actual shot at making a best friend for life. The car pulled up onto a large driveway, connected to an even larger house. It was huge, like mansion-sized. Probably the biggest house I'd ever laid eyes on. Me and my parents made our way over to the front door, which was about twice my dad's size, and he was six foot seven. There was no doorbell, instead there was an abnormally large silver knocker in the middle of the door. I knocked. Jessie answered the door. When she saw me her face seemed to light up and her smile grew larger. She instantly leaned in for a hug. Jessie's mother and father also approached the door and stood behind Jessie, also with a comforting smile on their face. Jessie's father was also tall like my own dad, he was your typical dad-looking person. It was the same with her mother, it was almost surreal. Jessie turned me around her huge house, which took about an hour in itself. Then we ventured off into Jessie's bedroom, which was huge and pink. Very pink. Like every object was pink. After staying in Jessie's room playing games and eating candy for a while, her mother walked into the room and placed a sheet of A4 paper on Jessie's bed. The way she walked was so elegant and graceful. I took up my headphones and grabbed the sheet of paper. It read, Sleepover Rules Follow these rules to ensure you have a safe and happy sleepover. 1. Don't eat too much candy. They can smell it from miles away. 2. Do not leave the bedroom after 1.45 a.m. Please remember this rule, your life depends on it. 3. If you happen to wake up during the night for no apparent reason, hide under the bed within 25 seconds. That way they cannot see you. 
4. Do not get snacks from the mini fridge during 8.56 p.m. and 9.47, you will not like what you find. 5. Make sure to turn off any light source, apart from the TV, you must keep this on all through the night. I can't emphasize how important this is. 6. If you wake up randomly and see Jesse sitting upright, awake in her bed, you must run. Lock yourself in the bathroom and do not come out for the rest of the night. If Jessie knocks and says she hurt herself and needs help, ignore her and do not reply. 7. If you wake up and hear the baby crying, ignore it completely. Don't even move, it isn't the baby. 8. Do not attempt to speak to Jessie during the night, and if she speaks to you do not reply. This is crucial if you want to stay safe. 9. If you hear a dog whimpering and scratching on the bedroom door, drag Jesse under the bed and then hide behind the bookshelf. We do not own a dog. 10. If you hear a ringing in your ear, run, leave the house, this is the only exception, if you don't, we all die. Have a lovely sleepover, smiley face. It had to be some kind of joke, these couldn't have been real, but I still had a feeling that I should follow these creepy rules. I folded the piece of paper and placed it in my right pocket. Then sat down again to play with Jesse. After about an hour, Jesse's dad opened the door. It's bedtime girls, you must go to sleep. I suddenly got very anxious, because this is why I had to start following the creepy rules. I held back all of my emotion because I didn't want to lose a friend like Jesse. Me and Jesse both got into bed. We top and tailed so my head was at the bottom end of her bed. Good night. Sweet dreams. She said, in between yawns. I don't know how my dreams were going to be sweet after reading those rules. Surprisingly, I fell asleep pretty quick. My sleep was pretty deep, and I didn't have any nightmares like most nights. And that's when I woke up. My stomach sank. I turned to see Jessie sitting upright, in her bed. Wide awake. I didn't want to believe that these rules were true, but my instinct was to just run. I bolted into the bathroom and locked the door behind me. After a solid few minutes of hyperventilating in Jessie's bathroom, I decided to unlock the door, I thought it was all probably stupid anyway. Just before my hand reached the lock, someone knocked on the door. I froze. Tina, help me. I've hurt my head and my vision's going blurry. I desperately wanted to open the door, but something in my head advised me against it. Jesse kept screaming for help. I slumped into the corner, shaking with every breath I took. She was screaming for hours. It was unbearable, her voice got less human-like and more distorted with every screech. By the time she stopped, I was already half asleep to put into perspective just how long her screaming went on. I woke up, the light from the sun outside made my eyes sting. My ears were still throbbing. I slowly got up from the corner of the bathroom and unlocked the door. Jessie was playing on her PS5, everything was totally normal. Hey Tina, she said in her usual jaunty tone. I think your mom and dad are already outside waiting for you in their car. I couldn't take speaking, everywhere in my body ached. I picked up my stuff and started walking downstairs. Jesse's parents waited at the bottom of the stairs. Your parents are outside waiting for you, said her mother with a smile. How did they get here so quickly? It was only quarter to nine. I could see the open door and my parents' car outside. I was so relieved, I was gonna leave this place finally. Jesse's dad showed me out, and I hopped into my parents' car. I can't begin to explain how relieved I was to see my parents' smiling faces again. Jesse and her family waved at me as I drove away. How was the sleepover, sweetie? I was about to reply when I got a notification on my phone. It was a message from my mom. It said, Hey, I was just messaging to ask what time you wanted me and your dad to pick you up from Jesse's house. 
I looked back up at my mom, who was driving, and then to my dad, who was smiling eerily at me. Shit. I forgot to leave on the TV. I felt sick to my stomach. Forgot something? My dad asked me. Something strange happened about three weeks back, and I've struggled to even put it together cohesively in my head. But I'm going to try, because I think that what happened at my sister's sleepover might actually be more widespread than I imagined. Looking back now, I don't even remember how many girls were there. I think it was 10 or 12. All of them in the 8th grade and close to my sister Rachel. As they got into their sleeping bags and told each other stories, me and my best friend Kurt had a devilish idea. We're going to scare these girls senseless, he said wickedly. I have to admit, it was just for cheap thrills. But I didn't see the harm. We got into my father's workshop and stole a few of his basic paint supplies to make Kurt look like a typical horror movie vampire. Then we went to the backyard and started to climb the tree outside of Rachel's window. Kurt was in place, ready to start making the usual boogeyman noises when he froze and squinted into the window. What the hell? He muttered as he tried to look in. Hey! What are you doing? Don't be a peeping Tom. I shouted up at him, trying to figure out why he was hesitating to start the scare. Then suddenly his eyes widened and he started to fumble backwards. I watched as his feet slipped from under him and he fell to the ground. It happened in slow motion. But the sound of his head hitting the bird fountain in our backyard is one that I will never forget. Jesus Christ. Kurt, are you okay? I screamed. I looked up, waiting to see if my sister or one of her friends would stare out and see this horrific accident. I tried to prop his head up and stop the bleeding. Then I reached into my pocket to call 911. But I hesitated. I know it's dumb, but my parents were already going to give me a tongue lashing for being stupid anyway. I didn't want the cops to find me for something like this, so I ran inside and used Kurt's phone instead. As dumb as that was, what I did next was even stupider. I went back out and after checking to make sure he was okay and not bleeding out, I decided to climb the tree and see whatever it was that had caused him to act so strangely. Slowly, I crawled up the branches and peered through the window to where my sister and her friends were sleeping. All except for one of them. It's been so long now and I still remember that ungodly sight. One of the girls was standing there, crouching over the other girls with a sharp knife slashing wildly at the defenseless sleeping friends. I will never forget the look on her face as she swung that knife. That's when the girl looked straight at me. I nearly fell back like Kurt did. But instead, I stared her down across the darkness. She already seen me. What good would it do running away? She could never make it outside in time to catch me regardless. Suddenly, she started making her way to the door and I could see that some of the other girls were moving. I scrambled to get out of there. I didn't even wait for paramedics to show up and help Kurt. I didn't want to be around if she was coming to get me. I ran for what felt like hours and ended up at my grandparents' house on the outskirts of my town. I frantically tried explaining to them what had happened. They called my parents and eventually they started putting the story together. Kurt was in the hospital with his head injury, and apparently all the girls were fine. I went to see Kurt a while later to see what he remembered. Nothing. So now there's rumors that I attacked Kurt and put him in hospital and then ran away to avoid trouble. I tried talking to my sister about what I saw, but she denies that anything of the sort happened and treats me like I'm crazy.
This happened when I was 11 years old. At the time I was living in an apartment situated on a street with an ongoing construction. Needless to say, they often tapped into the electric supply and the power fluctuated quite a bit. Therefore the street lights often served no real purpose, especially in the winters when evening dawned on us with pitch black darkness. That is relevant, so keep it in mind. From what I remember, it was a weekend I was supposed to spend at my friend's house. For an 11 year old me, this was an exciting prospect, having been loaded with schoolwork the entire week. I was to spend what I believed to be Friday night sleeping over and spend the entirety of Saturday at her bungalow to return home that very evening. What made it even better was the fact that her parents had an event they could not avoid and therefore trusted us to stay alone in their two-floor house for the entirety of the six hours they were gone. Back then, the idea of spending a whole night alone with my friend was great, no interference in a whole six hours of games and movies on their huge TV. As it turns out my friend had other ideas. I arrived at her house just short of 8 p.m. It was already pretty dark out and her parents had waited for me to arrive before telling us about emergency contacts, dinner, and such. They also reminded us to get their four-year-old Labrador inside as the weather was acting up and his kennel had a few loose panels which leaked when it rained. This is also an important fact to be noted. After they left, we watched a few cartoons, had dinner, and were chilling in her living room playing cards. That's when my friend Sid had the ingenious idea of exploring a fence plot of land a few hundred meters down the street that she resided on. There was no construction happening in there so what little of that area didn't have shambles was overgrown with plants and weeds. We got the dog inside, leashed it to its long chain that allowed it to roam within reason, got the keys and left the house to make the short 10-minute trip. At this point it was about 10 p.m. In retrospect, this is where we still had a chance to avoid this particular encounter, but being curious and daring kids, we ventured anyways. Rather uneventfully, we arrived and set to climbing over wall which was about 2 meters. Luckily for us, the wall was broken enough in places to make good holds to carry us over. Once inside, Sid suggested that we sit a few meters away from each other for as long as we could until one of us was too scared to do so. We faced each other and walked backwards till there was just enough light to see the general silhouette of the other. After what seemed to me like a good ten minutes, I saw Sid's hunched form rise and start to walk towards me. She seemed to be walking rather fast and in a haphazard manner, jumping over rocks at a daring pace, even getting cut by some thorns in the process. She came up to me and just as I was about to laugh and call her out on being scared, she told me to get up because she needed to go feed Shaggy. I remember being really confused because her parents had already filled his bowl with food and he had this water thing which he could operate in case he was thirsty. But I saw her face and let me just say I have never seen her this pale. She looked like she had seen a ghost. So without asking questions, I said okay and we made our way back over the wall, albeit in a tense manner and rather quickly. The moment my feet touched the ground, I felt Sid grab my arm and straight up just start sprinting down the street. To put things into perspective, I had a bruise from the way she grasped it for two weeks straight. So we ran like hell and eventually arrived at her house and went in through her front yard fence gate. A towering metal gate without bars and she told me to unlock the front door while she dead bolted the metal gate's various locks into the ground. At this point, I was starting to panic but we got into the house and Sid then proceeded to run around the house locking and closing all possible windows and doors as well as pulling the curtains shut. I was very confused as to why she was doing this and so was her dog who stood there and followed her around while she made the place secure. After about 10 minutes she came back into the ground floor living room and with a very scary expression, she explained to me that the reason she did all that was because while we were sitting apart, she happened to glance away to a few meters to my right to see another human silhouette crouching in the bushes. She thought she was imagining it until it moved closer to where I was sitting and seemed to be unaware that my friend was watching them. I would have loved to say that was the end of it but what happens next has stuck with me until today 
and I held a fear of that situation from that point onward. To give you an idea of the layout of her compound, her house was surrounded on two sides by a lawn, and the lawn was then surrounded by a wall two and a half meters high. The wall had one entrance which were the tall metal gates I talked about previously. The house itself had windows all around the perimeter as well as two potential entrances. The first being the front door, while the second being a door to this small attached space next to the house, which was made of see-through metal like the kind which metal fences are made of but stronger. This space had a metal door with a lock only accessible from the inside, as well as a door which was on the wall. However, this door only had a deadbolt on and was made of light wood. This is also of importance. So an hour or so after the incident, we were upstairs in her air-conditioned room playing games on her computer and talking about whatever it is kids talk about when we heard the dog bark downstairs. It was growling and seemed to bark at random intervals. Keep in mind that her dog was a friendly Labrador who rarely ever growled or barked aggressively. My friend went to get the dog upstairs to her room and after she returned she informed me that the dog was standing near the front door, growling at it and that it took her quite a bit of effort to get him upstairs as he kept trying to go back there. We were really confused as this was unusual for him to do, and thinking that a stray dog may have caught his attention, we decided to go into the balcony attached to a room that gave us a view onto the front lawn and a part of the street directly in front of the house. Instead of seeing what we assumed would be a stray animal, we looked down to see a person standing very still in her lawn and in front of her front door. In the limited light we could make out heavy layers of muddy looking clothing and a head full of hair that looked very matted. The dog was with us in the balcony and was whining to be let outside. We crouched in her balcony and right as we were about to discuss this situation, we heard what sounded like the front door rattling as if someone was trying to open it with a handle. We creeped back downstairs only to realize that this person had now moved onto the window next to the door and was trying to open that. The realization hit that he was trying to find an entrance into the house by going round the perimeter. Just as we were about to creep back upstairs, my friend grabbed me again and in a hushed tone told me that she had forgotten to lock the attached space door in her hurry before. We both looked at each other and paled as we realized that it would gain the intruder easy access into the house as the inner door had nothing but a deadbolt. At this point we heard the windows rattling behind the house nearly three quarters of the way back to the front again. The attached space door was a few meters away from the front door and we were lucky that he had chosen to go around the other side. She told me to wait by the inner door with the dog while she went outside and bolted the metal door. She then informed me to close the door as soon as she returned and that if she was caught to let the dog outside and to close the inner door as discreetly as possible as to not give myself away. We were both terrified and since we had no time to argue about it, I stood guard at the inner door while she went to the outer door, fumbled with the lock and returned inside practically running as quietly as she could. We closed the inner door and just then we heard the outer door rattle harshly. Had she not gone there and then, there was a big chance that we would have no choice but to hide in her house had he found his way in. After he tried opening all doors and windows, which took a while as he was doing it quite intently and forcefully. We found our way back upstairs and went back into her balcony to see if he had gone away, as we were standing still near the foot of her stairs for a while, listening for any further activity. As we looked down we saw him once again standing in her front lawn. However this time we could see his head was tilted back and it felt like he was looking right at us. However we knew that it was far too dark for him to be able to spot us, as we closed all the windows shut. We had proceeded to kill the lights in her room, as well as draw on the curtains as to not let her little bedside light escape the blinds. He then started giggling in the quiet of the night, and proceeded to go down on all fours, crawling around the lawn in front of the house while his laughter grew. In retrospect, we should have called the authorities at this point, but being the terrified kids we were, we did not want to get into trouble for not even being able to follow simple instructions. He did this for nearly half an hour, only to stand up once again facing the street. Then he started climbing on top of the kennel in the corner, 
up onto the top of the wall, and then jumping down to repeat the loop. We stood still in our balcony, waiting to see if he would return, but an hour passed, and that was the last we saw of him. At around 2 a.m. her parents returned. The next morning they were very confused as to why all the doors and windows were closed on such a pleasant night and why there was mud on the front doorknob. We said we just wanted to play in the dark inside the house, lying about the actuality of the situation. To this day I do not think the man has been caught. I was 13 when this happened to me. I stayed at my friend's house almost every weekend. She had a huge bedroom and I just lived with my mom in a small apartment, so whenever I stayed there it felt like I had a taste of what a real family home felt like. That would be true if it wasn't for the constant arguing that I hear from her parents. Her dad was always really nice to me, pretty much treating me like his own daughter. He'd buy us food and DVDs and make sure that we had the best sleepovers every week. Her mom, on the other hand, was always quite cold with me. She wouldn't really even speak to me. Most of the arguments that I could hear were shouting at him. Looking back, I realized that she was emotionally manipulating him, claiming he didn't love her and accusing him of being sleazy. But at the time, I just thought this was what parents would do every night. Anyway, we would mostly just turn up the TV and distract ourselves from the shouting, and usually we'd have a really good night. This night was different. Her dad basically rushed us up to her room and we could tell he was stressed. I tried asking my friend about her parents, but she just deflected and said she didn't want to talk about it. We did our makeup and hair and tried on different outfits throughout the night, and within a few hours we were almost falling asleep whilst watching the first Twilight film. Suddenly we could hear her parents arguing really loudly. There were bangs and the sounds of things smashing. This wasn't normal. I could hear her mom practically screaming at her dad, throwing the usual accusations and seemingly hitting him. I know this because he was shouting stop. At some point he started to make his way upstairs and I hear him slam the door to their bedroom just next to the room we were staying in. It wasn't long until her mom made her way upstairs and burst into their room. I heard him shouting what the hell. And then lots of screaming and shouting. The whole house was practically shaking as they were throwing each other around their room and knocking into the wall. I felt really uncomfortable at this point and asked if we could lock the door. My friend agreed and reminded me to be quiet. Just as I clicked the lock, the screams and shouting went silent. My friend and I stared at each other, waiting until we heard one of them go downstairs or to make any kind of noise. Nothing. We waited for minutes, listening at the door and speculating what was happening. Had they just gone to sleep after all that shouting? Unlikely. Suddenly, I hear footsteps and rush back to bed. There's a gentle knock on the door. Honey, are you awake? Her mom was coming to check on us. She literally never did this. Before my friend could respond, her mom tried to open the door. She realized it was locked and then immediately started shouting loudly. Open the door. Now. I looked at my friend with begging eyes and told her not to open it. Her mom started pleading with us through the door, kicking it loudly, sending massive shocks throughout the room. Her mom turned her attention at me and started ordering me to open the door gradually getting more nasty, telling me I was a leech and that I would end up like my mother. Alone and miserable. I started crying and so did my friend. At this point I called my mom and told her what was happening. She could hear the door being kicked and the nasty comments and she told us to put something in front of the door. She told me she had to hang up for a moment whilst she called the police and we were both left there waiting for this terrifying moment to be over. The banging stopped and I could hear her mom's footsteps going down the hallway. The footsteps came back towards us and then things got seriously disturbing. The end of a knife burst through the door. 
It was shiny and long, and she repeatedly stabbed the door, gradually chipping away at the cheap wood. We were obviously screaming uncontrollably at this point, and I have a vivid memory of exactly when I noticed something terrible. As the knife came through the door, I noticed that the white paint around the hole started to turn red. It looked like the door was bleeding. My first thought was that she hurt herself whilst on her rampage, but my friend's screams suddenly made me realize exactly what had happened. She started screaming for her dad. It hadn't even crossed my mind. She only walked a few steps to go and collect this knife. Why would she have a knife in her bedroom, and why would it be covered in blood? Up until this point I thought we were just going to be in trouble with her psychotic mom. Maybe she would take away our snacks and make us go to bed, or send me home. I was pretty naive, but it just didn't cross my mind that she was going to kill us. The door was slowly coming apart and she was just grunting loudly every time she'd stab the door. She was evidently getting tired, but she wasn't giving up. My friend was still screaming for her dad and I was a complete mess, crying and pleading for her mom to stop. She started trying to reach her hand through one of the cracks she'd made, but she couldn't reach the lock. At this point when she'd reach for the lock through the smashed door, she was ripping her skin along her forearm, desperately trying to get in. Her arm was flailing around through the hole. We both cuddled up in the corner of the room, exhausted from all the crying. She was going to get through and there was nothing as small girls could do to stop her. We both hear something that makes us stop sobbing and we look directly into each other's eyes. Police sirens. The cops were here and we were going to be saved. Her mom clearly heard them as well because she started going feral on this door. She was screaming and smashing at it with both hands, occasionally stabbing wildly at the hole she made. We'd thrown a small bedside table and a chair next to the door, which lined up perfectly with her wardrobe, creating a line of furniture that perfectly blocked the door from opening, even if it was unlocked. The cops started banging on the front door and she made the choice to violently shove her arm through the hole, ripping open her arm. I watched as she pushed through the pain, finally reaching the door lock. She'd done it. She was nearly inside. She opened the door a few inches before our barricade stopped her from pushing it any further. Her hand once again reached through and started clawing at the bedside table we put there. She was gradually moving it and it was clear she was making progress. She pushed through enough that her shoulder was now in the room and her arm was slowly shifting the table to the side. All while this is happening, the police are smashing the front door, reacting to our terrified screams. All at once, we hear the door downstairs give way, the cops shouting for us, their footsteps running up the stairs. Her mom must have used all her energy to force the door open and lunge straight towards us. We were crouched in the corner, unable to quickly react. She landed on my friend and gripped her neck with ferocity. I remember how fast she turned purple. She was still holding my hand and struggling wildly, trying to get free whilst her own mother was choking the life out of her. The cops burst into the room, immediately tackling her to the ground. There was so much screaming and shouting and flashlights and I think they even used a taser. It was overwhelming. My friend lay next to me, barely breathing and having a seizure. They ran to her aid and one female cop kept checking me and asking me if I was okay scanning me for injuries and trying to get a response from me. I think I just froze at this point because I don't remember much of what happened after. I know we went to hospital for a while and I remember them putting a shiny blanket on me, which made no sense to me at the time. Throughout the night we learned that her dad had been stabbed to death. I think he had over 80 stab wounds all over his body. Her mom was sent to a psych ward and remains there today, over 10 years later. I never saw my friend again after that night. She was sent away to live with her grandparents. It completely messed me up for years. I was a dark and troubled teenager, even now I have terrible anxiety around staying at other people's houses. I used to dream about having both parents living at home together, but I realize now that my home life was much better than what my friend had.
Even though this happened 12 years ago, I still remember it very vividly. When I was 14, I was visiting a friend I hadn't seen in a few years, and we were pretty excited to hang out again. His parents always treated me like I was their own son, so I was pretty stoked. He lived on a 20-acre ranch with two dogs and a cat. We were watching horror movies with all the lights off in his family's camper out on their driveway while the family was inside. We went inside to get pizza, popcorn, and other junk food at around 12. My friend fell asleep pretty early, going to bed at 2 a.m. I was playing GTA when I heard the dogs barking very loudly. I brushed it off, thinking one of the ducks or chickens was messing with the dogs, or maybe even a deer or a coyote. Fast forward about 20 to 30 minutes, I needed to take a piss, so I went out, and I will never forget the face that looked back at me. The person ran off into the dark toward the entrance to the ranch. Sure, I was alarmed, but I still had to take a piss. I finished my business and went back inside, making sure to lock the camper door before returning to what I was doing. About another 20 to 30 minutes later, I heard the dogs barking again. This time, I woke up my friend and told him everything. He was skeptical at first, but then he looked at the blinds of the camper, and I will never forget the look on his face when he looked back at me. We called his parents, and his dad answered. He told him everything, but he thought we were trying to pull a prank. He laughed, saying, y'all boys aren't gonna get me. Nice try though. I started to confirm that we were being honest and when he heard the panic in my voice he realized we were being serious. He quickly rushed out with his gun and threatened to shoot whoever was on their property. We heard all this from inside the camper and we were terrified. We heard a blood curdling scream and then three gunshots went off. We went outside and we saw a guy on the ground. My friend's mom called the cops while all this unfolded. They lived out in the country so it took about 25 to 30 minutes for the cops to show up. Now the entire family was outside, terrified. The youngest of them all, whom we'll call Jacqueline, was crying. Not just because of the dead man about 20 feet ahead of her, but because the man had killed one of the dogs, maybe because it was very loud. Then the cops showed up, and it turns out the man was a prison escapee from just 15 miles away from my friend's house. We don't know why exactly the guy was there, but he was put behind bars for killing two people. Still to this day, we don't know if he was there to kill us. My best friend was sleeping over when we were about 11 or 12 and we were hanging out in my room. I was on my bed and she was on a mattress between my bed and the window. Out of absolutely nowhere, we hear a bang and my wall-length window totally shatters. Glass flies all around the place and we both got cut pretty bad. We both start losing our damn minds and run out of the room. Both of us were covered in blood and we cut our feet as we ran over the glass. My dad flies into action mode and locks us in the pantry, grabs a kitchen knife and runs into the backyard to look for anyone who may have been behind the window smashing. There was no one so he calls the police and tends to our injuries. When the police arrive, they search my room for a cause and discover a huge solid ball bearing, presumably from a truck. It had landed less than 20 centimeters from where my friend's foot had been. If it had hit one of us, it could have killed us. There is no roads or anything near us and my room faced into the back fence, so to this day we still have no clue where it came from or how it was traveling at such a speed. It cleared multiple fences and smashed a window. Easily traveling at least half a mile to the nearest road, if that's where it came from. My mom had been out getting us McDonald's while this whole ordeal went on, so she was more than a little shocked when she arrived home. It still makes no sense to me how something like that could have been launched so far, at such an angle to hit my window. My dad thinks it fell off a plane, but where are the odds of it landing on us?